So, Kip, how you doing? Pretty good. Let's see. Um, all right, you can see me. Excellent. I can see you. I'm gonna I'm gonna read your introduction, and if you <laughs> can bring up your slides, we'll be ready to roll. Absolutely. Okay. So, Kip Bradford. He's coming from Gradient. His presentation is the role of window heat pumps in building decarbonization. I'm so excited about this. Kip Bradford is the Chief Technology Officer at Gradient Incorporated. He is an engineering researcher working at the boundaries of emerging technology and industries. He was a senior research scientist at the MIT Media Lab, hired as a result of the Professor of Other Faculty Search for an interdisciplinary scientist. His work merges biology, ecology, and thermodynamics to develop new ways to manage climates at every scale, from personal thermal comfort up to global weather systems. Heck yeah, Kit. Welcome. Thank you. Um, let me see. Still trying to get, get the, the slide. Uh, well, while you're doing that, just so you know, I, man, window heat pumps, I've been thinking about this for a while long time like going to grant to central park and walking around seeing all the window air conditioners that people have installed in super duper mansions over central park and they're using crummy window air conditioners that we all know are like really loud they're like yes. not murder controlled they're dripping water and it's like you have like a 200 300 year old stone building over central park and that's how you air condition your living room your bedroom and then like my sister, and I'm just riffing for you here while you get yeah. <laughs> she lives in one of those apartment complexes where they run the yeah. air conditioner even during the fall and spring because the heating system is on the building for the whole building and they just sweat and the windows are open all winter long because they're sweating from the lack of control in their apartment. So with that, you understand. Excellent. Very yeah. <laughs> I think I got it. Working here, um, it, it's only two years since we've been uh, doing presentations over Zoom, and um, you know, got it working again. It's great. Um, it's perfect. Thank well, you for the introduction, yeah. John. And I, um, I'm sorry I missed some of the earlier presentations today. Uh, my kids got sent home from school with a COVID exposure, so everything's been chaos. And I'm sure many of you know uh, what this is like. So. Um, I'm, I'm going to start by giving a little uh, plug and shout out to the Department of Energy. Uh, my background is the uh, Impel program from Berkeley Lab, which is supporting um, a lot of other innovators who are trying to get into the game to, to address climate change. Uh, and I'm a mentor there. They're doing great stuff. It's you know government agency doing their best to change the world uh, for better. Um, but the thing that I want to talk about today is window heat pumps, as Sean mentioned, and uh, particularly some of what we're doing at Gradient. Um, but uh, so I'll start with, with our mission. Um, we're trying to cool the world by transforming every home and building uh, to make it more comfortable and use less energy. And, and really, this is something that, that I stumbled into um, a while back when I was hired to the MIT Media Lab through this professor of other faculty search, uh, I joined the Media Lab and my first couple days there, a number of the senior faculty had come up to me and saying, you know, we've got this amazing building, but it's uncomfortable as hell. It's always either too hot or too cold. We can't control the temperatures in our offices. We paid a lot for this architect to make this beautiful building, but we heard that you do HVAC stuff so you can fix the building. And it's true in my job talk, 45 minutes of me blabbering on about uh, the future of XYZ, there was about a three minute segment uh, where I talked about an air conditioner startup that I had in 2008, 2009, making secondary loop window air conditioners that I had patented, as well as uh, later medical devices that were um, in Air Force helicopters that were keeping people's bodies at a stable temperature after they had traumatic injuries that use secondary loops. So I was very into HVAC. Uh, my background is biomedical engineering actually, and, and I got into HVAC through the thermal comfort um, realm. And I quickly found out that, that people in this industry don't really think about comfort uh, in terms of, of HVAC and air conditioners. What they're really focused on is temperature, energy, heat exchange, and the human element was, was really left out. So my first air conditioning startup 
was focused on how do I bring comfort to building occupants with the least amount of, of energy. And that was in 2008, 2009, like I said, very, very bad time to be on the East Coast trying to raise money to do a hardware startup. So we got a lot of interest. We won some design awards and, uh, and I got a patent out of it. And then things kind of went quiet for a while and I went and consulted and did some other things. Um, when I was at the, when I applied for this job at the Media Lab, I applied as a biomedical engineer who had done a lot of management consulting and, and things that I thought would be interesting. But the thing that, that was the little seed that they hooked into was really this, this fact that I did HVAC. Like I built air conditioners and chillers and, and things of that nature in my garage um, for medical devices. I built a wearable air conditioner um, for, for Adam Savage from Mythbusters that was modeled on a wearable air conditioner I built for NASA for their spacesuit simulator. So I had this weird thread of HVAC stuff and uh, Nicholas Negroponte sat me down and said, you can, you can really control temperature in a lot of environments. Uh, what about cooling the world? What about tackling climate change through innovations around thermodynamics? And we brainstormed for several months and came up with a lot of really interesting areas that had high impact and right after that, a uh, beautiful coincidence, the book Drawdown came out and Drawdown really brought home how important it was to reduce the global warming impact of air conditioners in particular. And when I joined MIT, Nicholas said, your job here is to create a new field of science that is uniquely you that has both magic and impact. And if you, succeed, if you do that successfully, you'll become a tenure track professor at MIT. And it's like, oh, this is, this is fantastic. Um, fortunately, I did not become a tenure track professor at MIT at the Media Lab. Um, this was all before the Jeffrey Epstein uh, episodes. And instead, I went to Yale to the School of Architecture to help start a new center for ecosystems and architecture to really look at the flows of energies into and out of the environment. And that really got me thinking about buildings in particular. So if you think about buildings, I'm sure um, all of you are well aware and, and uh, have been discussing this, very, very large greenhouse gas impact because of the emissions from buildings. We see um, simultaneously that the growth in the middle class globally and the fact that a lot of that growth is taking place uh, around the equator in large cities we're looking at a massive increase in the number of, of air conditioners in the world. And we also know that air conditioners have three profound effects that destroy the climate. One is that the refrigerants are very, very damaging. And number two is that the direct emissions um, from these products are, are uh, negative. And I, I say direct, um, what I mean is the, the emissions from energy generation that powers the air conditioners. So maybe that's the indirect and then the direct emissions we'll, we'll call the refrigerants. And then the third effect is that when you run air conditioning, you're, they're not perfectly efficient devices. So for every watt of heat or cold you generate, you generate some number of watts of waste. So you have this, this triplicate effect that is helping to warm the planet um, and it's greater than a lot of industries that people are more familiar with, like the trans impact of transportation on climate change. And today, the typical product that we see is, is your standard rectangular box. Um, it really has evolved a lot, surprisingly, since Will Willis Carrier's time. People at other startups, um, I'm, I'm going to throw them under the bus, uh, Windmill and July, uh, two window air conditioner startups that are talking about how, you know, we're a, a new high tech product and window air conditioners haven't changed at all since, since Willis Carrier's day. Well, I have news for them, which is that these products are far more efficient, far more effective, um, use advanced refrigerants, they don't blow up. They don't have toxic chemicals inside them that, that uh, leak out into people's homes and kill them as products that ran off of, um, say, ammonia did or hydrogen sulfide. So we, we have a, 
that product has improved immensely, primarily because of government regulations, but there's still a long way to go. Um, but before I take us in that direction, I'm gonna um, draw on my, my um, architecture experience at Yale and collaborating with, with folks at the School of Architecture at Princeton. Um, this is a building in Brazil that, if you're familiar with the concept of critical regionalism from, from architecture, the, the idea that you build buildings that fit into the local environment, that, that work with the local environment. So if, if you're in Singapore and it's hot and humid, then you design for natural ventilation and shading. If you're in uh, the middle of the desert in, say, um, Abu Dhabi, then you design for the fact that it's hot and dry and you take advantage of evaporative cooling and create natural airflow channels that uh, accentuate that cooling. So that concept uh, in some ways is very quaint. It's, it is great architectural practice, but it doesn't necessarily fit as well with, with today's uh, world, with our business practices, with ASHRAE standards that if you're gonna build a building and you don't wanna get sued by the building occupants or the building owner, you build to the standard. If the standards say that the interior of the building has to be 68 degrees during the summer and um, you know, 70 degrees during the winter, then you build to that standard. But before ASHRAE really pushed those standards, there was a lot of, of really interesting innovation. Uh, these are the architects of uh, the building I was just showing you and they designed this really fantastic uh, daylight and ventilation control system that were a series of louvers on the side of the building that allowed for uh, natural ventilation, that allowed for control of, of solar energy gain um, and, and helped the building occupants control the environment around them. And we know from uh, researchers like Gail Brager at uh, Berkeley that, that the ability to control the temperature that surrounds you gives you more comfort uh, at a wider temperature range than the ASHRAE standards uh, typically would, would allow. Um, and this building was a set of just really innovative buildings that took advantage of, of uh, the local environments, uh, local know-how and natural features. Um, but because of standardization and because of uh, high maintenance costs of some of these features, um, what you see on the left here became what you see on the right. So the, the facade of this building was, was deconstructed and all the natural ventilation features were replaced with these window air conditioners. Um, here's another example of that on a uh, different side of the building. So unfortunately, uh, as Sean had mentioned, we have these loud, ugly, and inefficient window boxes. They're very, very affordable in terms of, of first cost of install. If you look at the lifetime cost, though, the energy plus the hardware cost, plus the fact that these last maybe five or 10 years, means that there's, there's a financial opportunity to make a product that lasts longer, that uses less energy. And right now, the alternative tends to be the mini split. And where you're able to modify the building, like you can drill a hole through the wall, you can hang a box on the outside of the, of the building, um, you can install mini splits, they're highly efficient, they do require a uh, licensed technician, um, and they're also not hermetically sealed. By not hermetically sealing them, that means you have a refrigerant line that goes from the outdoor box to the indoor box, you create this opportunity for the refrigerants to leak. And we already have discussed the fact that the refrigerants themselves are, are high global warming potential gases. So we're, we have two product options on the market today. We have a window air conditioner that fills up the window that's not very efficient. And that lack of efficiency is primarily because they're cost optimized to be sold at retail um, and, and they need to be cost competitive versus so maybe $300 for your average um, window air conditioner versus a mini split, which installed uh, in the US might average around five or $6,000 depending on your region and requires you to, to either be the, the building owner uh, or get the building owner's permission and requires you to have access to the facade of the building. So 
about 10 years ago, um, seeing these as, as two kind of conflicting options and nothing in between, I um, invented and patented this idea for a modular split system that did not require professional installation and could be hermetically sealed. And the motivation behind this at the time was that I didn't have a, an HVAC license and I didn't know how all these pieces came together. And I thought, well, if I can just buy a heat pump that had a water loop attached, there's a lot of possibilities in what I could design as a product designer. Um, fast forward <laughs> 10 years, like I said, not the best time to be trying to get a startup going uh, in this area. But um, when I was at MIT, a researcher from Other Lab, which is a startup accelerator in San Francisco, contacted me through the Other Lab network. I'd, I'd uh, been involved with the founders of Other Lab and said, hey, I've got this really interesting technology for a really cool heat exchanger that is made of polymers. It's uh, conformable. It's low cost. We can make it any size and shape that we want. And I thought, oh, this is really, really interesting. But what really struck me is when he said, and we want to put this into a window air conditioner uh, that hangs over the windowsill and uses a secondary loop. And I said, whoa, <laughs> you must have been reading my mind because you know, I patented this and I'd love to work with you on it. Uh, so I joined what was then Tro as an advisor. Um, and then um, Vince, the founder, the other founder convinced me to come on as a co-founder, bring my intellectual property to the table and combine the polymer heat exchangers that he'd been working on with, with this architecture um, for a modular system that, that I developed. Um, so this is what the product looks like. And uh, just for comparison, it's not necessarily any smaller or lighter, uh, but it has a lot of benefits. And um, some of the benefits are that we're optimizing the, we can, we can tune this obviously. So we're tuning the product, um, one product for just pure air conditioning markets uh, with heating benefits, but, but uh, we're also developing product specifically or a variant of this product specifically for cold climates with the idea that, that yes, we're gonna sell many, many products hopefully as, uh, people around the world are, are installing air conditioners in buildings, but also as building uh, stock in places like New York get retrofit. And so this brings me to an important point about why window air conditioners. Um, I, again, have this, this Department of Energy background uh, to, to give a shout out to some very just wonderful people who are doing great stuff. And one of the things that they're doing is the NREL solar decathlon. Um, again, many of you are aware of that, that solar decathlon, net zero houses. When I judged the net zero houses, there's some amazing technology coming out of Europe and Asia and America that, that uses energy very, very efficiently to provide thermal comfort. So hydronic heating, hydronic cooling, uh, ground source heat pumps coupled with hydronic, um, systems that allow the, the uh, fresh air exchange when appropriate and can switch over between fresh air uh, and natural ventilation and um, energy enhanced comfort systems, again, like, like uh, radiant, um, hydronic radiant systems. And that technology is really fantastic when you're building a new building. But unfortunately, there's a substantial amount of existing building stock around the world where those systems are going to be way too expensive to install, uh, way too cumbersome, or just, just technologically difficult. There's, there's not the, um, say, electricity available in New York public housing um, to install a mini split where you've got, you need a 220 volt uh, service typically and um, you have to wire directly into the building, that's just not possible. Even though there are 120 volt um, mini splits, direct wiring is not something that, that is really feasible in those buildings because upgrading the wiring will cost substantially more than putting in say cheap window air conditioners. So we are eager to provide an option 
for building retrofits that reduces carbon, um, allows the, the building stock to go all electric um, and by eliminating combustion heating, by reducing the leakage of refrigerants into the atmosphere um, and having high efficiency, low energy options, we think that in New York, we can make a substantial impact on decarbonization. We've looked at California um, with, with the added benefit of directly powering these products uh, with grid integrated, grid tied solar. Um, you know, same story in California in terms of reduction of uh, emissions from a building per building perspective. Um, and, oh, and can I just ask, if you go back yeah. to that last slide, um, the gradient 2022, 2023, 2024, CC cold climate, I assume. Yep. Um, yes. So right now you have a single speed version. It kicks uh, up electric resistance or, oh, go ahead. Yeah, what do you got? No, no, no. We, we've, we've invested a lot of time and effort in, um, in variable speed, variable capacity systems. So we, we, again, a typical window air conditioner, the thermodynamics is, is very, very well known. Like thermodynamics hasn't changed, you know, at all since, <laughs> since the big bang. Um, and there's, there's a lot of, of efficiency potential left on the table for your, your typical window air conditioner. The reason why a standard window air conditioner is inefficient is because it uses fixed speed motors. So the compressor cycles on and off and you get the, the turn on surge and all the loss associated with that. You can't load match. Um, you have a fixed orifice uh, capillary tube that the refrigerant goes through to get its phase change. And you can't adjust the, the phase change set points to load match and match the, the temperatures you're trying to evaporate at. Um, so when you, when you incorporate variable capacity motors, uh, variable speed motors, variable capacity uh, refrigerant expansion valves, and then oversized heat exchangers, you can really push these systems um, to very, very high efficiency approaching the, the maximum efficiency of some of the products on the market that like Carrier and, and Samsung sell and Mitsubishi. Um, so we said, you know what, we're gonna sell a premium product today that um, is, is premium only in that it's more expensive than a window air conditioner. But when you, when you look at the cost of mini splits, either out of the box or installed, we're in line with the out of the box cost of mini split, but without any of the installation cost. So our, our reason for doing that is um, we want people to be able to adopt this product widely. Like it doesn't really matter if we make the high, most uh, efficient product on the earth that nobody can install. And being able to take this out of a box and drop it in, into any window, um, you know, today we have a mounting bracket that constrains the window size, but uh, in general, the, the concept is that you've got an outdoor unit and an indoor unit, just like a, a regular mini split, and we can put on a mounting bracket inside the window. There's no refrigerant that enters the, the building envelope. You can hang it on a bracket outside the wall and have a wall penetration for the uh, water, the secondary loop lines, you know, water glycol and electrical connections. Um, so it gives us a lot of flexibility in the future um, with the product configuration. So if I'm understanding, this is the California emissions, and you're assuming there's not much electric heating here because we have a, a warm winter, whereas the, your slide showing New York had a fair yeah. amount of gray electric resistance heating because of sub five degree Fahrenheit weather or something like that? Um, well, so right now, the, this is a slightly different way of looking at it is... Um, the, the leftmost column is what you, your emissions because of combustion. Mm -hmm. um, electric cooling is less than that. And then the refrigerant losses are less than that. When we say electric heating, um, this is a combination of resistance heating to supplement the, the heating that our product currently has. So it, we, we have mm -hmm. not fully tuned the product to be as effective as it can be as a cold climate heat pump um, because of some of the size constraints and just manufacturing limitations. So we're, we're working towards those optimizations. And right now, 
um, that gray bar is, is your total electric consumption of, of heat pump and, um, and uh, direct electric heating. So that and, I, and the grid, like this is a, a, New York has perhaps a dirtier grid than California's grid. Yeah, yeah. So New York's, ah, okay. New York's grid is a little bit dirtier. Right now, at least there's, there's less renewables on the grid. Um, I actually have an app on my phone that I can pop on right now and look at the grid mix of California and New York. Um, <laughs> so there's the ISO today is the California ISO. And um, I don't know if people are, can only see my slides or can see me too, but um, so the California ISO app, oh, I have to turn my background off to do that. Which I can do now. Uh, well, I, I mean, I, I, yeah, I might I'll... be distracting <laughs> you from your actual presentation. I apologize. I just wanted to make sure I understand. No, it, yeah, In... the, the, the numbers are really important to look at here because um, it, it is, you know, we, we don't want to be doing uh, resistive heating, but you do get to a point in cold climate zones where your, your coefficient performance of a heat pump an air source heat pump is going to approach one. Right. And at that point, you don't wanna continue running your, your cold climate heat pump as the temperature keeps going down because you don't wanna have a COP of less than one, you should just turn on your resistive heaters. Um, but up to that point, and, and there are some products in the market today that, that have a COP of like 1.8, uh, 2.0 down below, well below freezing, you know, to, to minus 15, uh, minus 20 C. Um, and they're really well optimized for that, but they tend to have really large heat exchangers. And, and the, the goal is that you have to minimize your, your temperature lift, uh, minimize the Delta T. And the only way to get a small Delta T is to have a really massive heat exchanger. So, you know, we're looking at how to most effectively do that um, in, in cold climates and, and what that means for the product. Thank you. Okay, I'll let you go back to your slides. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, no, actually, it, it, it is good. The The last couple of slides are just um, to kind of highlight some of what's inside. So, you know, again, physics has not changed since the, the Big Bang, as far as I know. Um, and we're, our product takes advantage of, of industry best practices. So we use every single motor is a, a high efficiency brushless DC variable speed motor. We've designed our own drives in a lot of cases um, and push the efficiency as, as high as the uh, semiconductors will let us go. Um, and actually brought a team on from Texas Instruments that designed the electronics that are in many, many products today. Um, we have a standard heat pump, uh, your typical compressor, heat exchanger, um, other copper components. And then the, the thing that's really novel in this case is that we have the secondary loop, which does in introduce a small efficiency penalty, but it also opens up a lot of possibilities in terms of, of hydronic, hydronic radiant, um, and sort of multi-point um, fan coils where, where you can have a window air conditioner, but you can really get the heat or cold close to the building occupants. Um, and there are just some more glamour shots of facades with the product. So uh, I'll stop there. And um, I don't know. If you want to... Fantastic. It's a dreamy project. I mean, and, like I've been wishing that we had this for a long time. I'm so glad that you're doing all the hard work and actually making it happen. <laughs> <laughs> we're, uh, we got a great team and we're, we're, we are working hard. Okay, so I think that um, your team said that you're gonna sell the product in the $2,000 range. Which you were saying sort of out of the box price? Yeah, that's, that's about that. Yep. Okay, and um, we've seen some cool little videos of how you uh, can install it and like hang a fairly heavy thing outside with counterbalancing. Can you speak a little bit to like how it gets installed? Yeah, the the bracket is actually a a, a really key innovation, and the idea is that we want this to ultimately be a one person install where you put a bracket in the window. Um, the bracket really clamps against the wall and provides the mechanical support. Um, and then you can take the outdoor part of the system, 
mount it onto the bracket, and then securely push it out of the window. So that does two things. One is that it prevents the risk of this falling out of the window. Um, and it also eliminates the possibility of theft. Like people can't, you know, you can, you can basically lock the window so that nobody can pull the air conditioner out and then have access. So that there's, you know, two inch gap um, when the window is fully closed against the product. So if somebody could, you know, physically remove this thing, which you can't because it's locked to the bracket, um, then you have a two inch gap that they're not gonna get through. Um, but the bracket's designed to take the, the load off of the, the person who's doing the installation. So it's actually got gas springs, which counter the weight of the, the cantilevered box. So you slide it onto the bracket and then with the gas springs, it's essentially uh, neutrally buoyant and you can just gently lower it down. And if you need to service it, it's exactly the opposite. You just gently lift it up and then slide it forward and lower it to the ground. Beautiful engineering, beautiful. Um, so when do you uh, when do you become like ready for sale? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm supposed to be working on the next person. Step <laughs> sorry, I'm really into your product. <laughs> um, we we are ramping up production now, um, hoping to have this in the market this summer. But given all supply chain chaos and uh, everything else. There's there's a chance that might be next summer, but uh, ideally we'll we'll have the product in the market um, Q3 this year, Q4. Okay, the world needs you. <laughs> <laughs> Keep on going, man. Okay, You're thank you, Kip. Working on it. Thank you very much for having me. If you can go over into the chat, no, thank you. Really, I'm so pleased. Um, so I want to be one of your customers, all these affordable housing developers that are on this chat here, a whole bunch of us are like, oh, a fast, easy way to electrify that plugs into a 120 volt outlet. Thank you. Sign me up. So yeah, thank you, Kip. Appreciate it. Great. With that, I'm going to introduce Stet Sanborn.